So good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm Anirudh Khetan. I'm I welcome you all to this amazing initiative by Fiki Arise on managing student engagement online. It's a part of a web series that we are doing to build capacity amongst teachers and educators around the country. You know, it's amazing that tech friendly. We've been trying this for years, but now it's happened now. So I got this really cool WhatsApp, uh, which said, who transformed digital education in India? And the choices were MHRD, NCRT, and COVID. So you take your pick. <laughs> which one did it? We've been trying it for years. But I truly believe crisis is the mother of all invention. So here we are. We are in this digital age and every teacher is going, you know, tech. So a little bit about myself. I run the Khetan Public School, Saibabad, and which is in Ghaziabad, and the Sunny Preparatory and High School in Kolkata. And of course, I'm the current uh, Fiki Arise treasurer. A little bit about Fiki. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of the introduction. It's one of the top known industry chambers for advocacy to the government of India. Uh, Fiki specifically in education has been extremely active in the last two decades, uh, whether the higher secondary or the vocational space. It's the first non-governmental body doing a lot of research on education and getting out white papers. So they work a lot with accommodations, come up with a lot of research and then present it to the government. Uh, I've been working with Fiki now for five years through Fiki Arise and they're just incredible. You know, the private school education space or the independent school education space is about 50% of the entire country. It's very unique, India, in those terms. So Fiki came up with something called Fiki Arise. Arise stands for Alliance for Reimagining School Education. Uh, it was formed five years ago, and it's a body of school promoters. I would like to uh, say they're all good schools, top schools. They're all, in fact, all schools are doing a great job. Um, and our primary focus has been policy advocacy to the government, uh, sharing best practices, building capacity, advocating 21st century readiness, aligning with the state, and of course, capacity building amongst all stakeholders. So today's webinar series, this, this entire webinar series is uh, towards that goal. So I can see we have more than 1,000 participants. We had more than... Uh, 6,000 registrations, I think. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, so we've got an incredible response. Just to give you some numbers, cumulatively over 25,000 people have been seeing this uh, webinar series and we are hoping to touch you know, much larger numbers. Um, before I go ahead, I would like to thank each one of you. I know we have uh, hopefully a lot of teachers here. I would like to thank each one of you to be our Corona warriors or I would like to say Corona angels. Uh, you are the reason that children are in today uh, from home and God knows if you were not there. I know I have four kids so uh, and they're engaged with their teachers and God knows if they were not there, what would we have done? Um, so your service to the nation is not going unrecognized and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your service. You all have uh, you know, things to do at your own home and, and it's, a, it's a great service you're doing. So thank you for that. Uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, you to our moderator, Ms. Pallavi Devedi. She's from Hire. Uh, Hire is our knowledge partner in this web series with Fiki Arise. I thank you for uh, uh, becoming a knowledge partner. Uh, Hire is a teacher, professional development and evaluation company, which enables educators and schools to make more informed choices about classroom teaching through data-driven personalized coaching programs for K-12 educators. Um, Pallavi herself has joined us as the moderator today. She is an education policy specialist, having previously worked with the UN and the government of India and has trained teachers across curriculums. She is also a trained IB and IGCSE secondary educator is a, and is a fellow of Teachers College, Columbia University. Great, guys. I'm going to put you over to Pallavi. Pallavi, over to you.
Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that introduction, Anirudh. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome on behalf of Hire to today's webinar. My name is Pallavi Devedi, and I'm the founder of Hire. We're a teacher professional development and evaluation company like Anirudh just uh, shared with you. Um, I'd like to thank Piki Arise for bringing us on board this exciting initiative to connect educators and to share classroom ideas that have worked from schools all around the world. I'm delighted to be sharing this space today with four innovative educators for today's panel. Uh, my first educator is Payal Datta Gupta. Payal is the IBDP biology um, faculty and instructional leader at the Heritage Experiential Learning School in Gurugram. I'm also joined by Dr. Archana Mishra. Uh, Dr. Mishra is the head of academics and innovation at the Sait MR Jaipuria School in Gomtinagar, Lucknow. I'm also joined by Ms. Sangeeta Gulati. Uh, Sangeeta is the head of department for mathematics at the Sanskriti School in New Delhi. Joining us all the way from Ghana is Barbara Bilgri. Barbara is the MYP and CAS coordinator at the Adrayan International School in Accra. Um, thank you so very much, all of you teachers, for having joined us today. And we look forward to have a very, very exciting and informative session uh, for all of the participants who've joined us in from all over the world. So without further ado, I'll now get started with the discussions for today. I'll get us started by sharing my screen and uh, take you over what we're gonna be addressing in today's session. Uh, before I start, I'd like to alert you all to um, a poll button at the bottom of your screens. Uh, we will be using this poll button um, for a very short poll that I've put together for you. And uh, through this poll, I'd like to first get a sense before we, uh, we get started with the session. Um, I'd like to first get a sense of where all of you are when it comes to student engagement. What are some of the challenges that you're facing in your classrooms currently? What are some of the, um, the issues? What are some of the, uh, the in, in terms of your own um, engagement of your own students, what are some things that have come up? So this poll, very quickly, right at the bottom of your screens, you'll be able to see this poll going live just now. Um, please take a minute to answer the questions on this poll. Uh, which of the following scenarios is most relevant to you? Your students don't attend lessons. Your students are disengaged during video lessons. Your students don't complete the tasks that are assigned or all of the above. And this will help us set the context for today's discussion. And we'll be able to then go ahead and try and see if we can find some solutions for some of these problems that all of you have been facing in your classrooms and then try and solve them together. Uh, so very, very clearly some answers are emerging. We can see that uh, student attendance is a, a relatively um, smaller problem, while it is a problem for almost 8% of you. Uh, but for a majority of you, we're seeing that um, students being uh, students not being able to complete the tasks assigned is a significant challenge. So thank you so much. I'm going to I'm going to try and close that poll now um, where our students are. So almost 23 percent of you said that your students are disengaged during the video lessons. Uh, 34 percent of you said that students don't complete the tasks assigned and about 35 percent of you said that including student attendance. All of these are some of your pressing challenges. Okay, so let's start first by understanding um, what are some of these barriers and why is it that our students are not really engaging with us when we're planning these, uh, these amazing lessons that all of us are working so hard on. Um, is, the, is, it, is it fair to say or for us to assume that the student is not really interested or is the problem a little deeper than that? So we're gonna start out by discussing what could potentially be preventing your student from engaging with your class. And we'll try and break down these barriers. And each of the speakers uh, who joined us today, all of our four educators, are going to be providing some solutions from their own classrooms that they have employed and they've found solutions for each of these different barriers. So we look forward to hearing from uh, all of our educators as well. So the first of these barriers is typically a logistical barrier. 
With this logistical barrier, we know that the student is unable to engage because there's either a connectivity issue, there aren't any clear norms or expectations that have been set, or there's an unfamiliarity with the tech tools that are being used in the class. The second of these is the social barrier. The social barrier is when a student is not able to demonstrate engagement because either there are no channels to interact with the teacher or there are no channels to interact with peers. So being able to show that the child is, uh, is engaged becomes a challenge. They might be engaged at their, own, at their own end, but you're not being able to, as a teacher, uh, gauge whether or not they are. So social barriers also uh, are a big challenge. The third of these are motivational barriers. And I feel that majority of our, uh, of our poll responses would probably fall into this category where we're saying that students face several distractions or procrastinate. And this is typically because there is no ownership of the work that they're doing. And to address each of these different barriers, we'll try and find solutions today. The first of these being when we're trying to address the logistical barriers, the most important and crucial solution is to set clear norms and expectations. This would include sending out a class schedule with access details, accessing tutorials, especially ones that you've made yourself would help onboard students, how a particular tool should be used, what goes into uh, signing up for Zoom. Uh, if you're using any particular tech tool, can you send them a, a, a how-to video for that, especially one that you've made yourself. Establishing these norms and expectations in terms of when and where they're supposed to sign up, homework deadlines, what should they do when they want to reach out to you, when they're struggling with something, what are these behavior expectations when they are online? Being online is something new to them. It's not a regular classroom environment. So it's important that you spell out to them what you're expecting of them uh, in the classroom online. Setting office hours for students also helps to address some logistical barriers where they, they know that they have access to you either over WhatsApp or over a Zoom call or a phone call on certain hours in a day. Um, a, a simple solution uh, like the one that you see on your screen right now, which is a, a screenshot of a Zoom call. Uh, if you create something like this and send it across to your students, it becomes easy for them to be able to figure out how they should operate Zoom and what are the different features therein. The second of these is addressing social barriers where students are unable to, or you, to demonstrate their engagement and you're unable to check for this engagement. So a very crucial part of that is to actually chunk your content or breaking it down into smaller parts and following it up with reviews and recall tasks. Some of our speakers today are going to be talking about exactly how they go about doing this in their lessons. Stressing on active learning where there's a clear application of what the student is doing also leads to the student being more involved and engaged. Problem solving, case studies, um, asking them to find real world solution problems to real world solutions. Um, so all of that helps to uh, indicate to the student that their learning is not just happening within the classroom, that they have opportunities or avenues of applying this in the real world. A very important part of checking for engagement is reminders. There are times when students tend to slip through the cracks. We have to follow up with them, especially because this isn't just online teaching, it's also teaching during a crisis. We don't know what's happening at home. And for many of them, it's not possible to keep up with, uh, with the kind of schedules that we've created for them because of the way things are at home. So sending reminders is useful. As a follow-up to that also, including non-academic tasks or check-ins, um, which don't necessarily involve uh, any kind of uh, very heavy duty school tasks. These also helps to hook students into what you're trying to get them to learn, recording songs with them or sending them on a virtual museum visit and asking them to come back and share what they learned. Uh, we are also going to be talking about some of these non-academic tasks today. Some teachers have examples of this uh, in their own presentations as well. Um, providing quick feedback is another very, very crucial thing. A student has sent you their work. They'd like to know how they've done. And if you don't let them know, they tend to get disengaged and they tend to be disinterested. So making your feedback very, very timely is also crucial. The last of these is um, that of addressing student agency. When you have challenges with students who are demotivated or who are feeling like they don't have any ownership of this work, you know that you're not hooking in student agency. And what does student agency really mean? 
Student agency is when you are able to give your students a voice to share their ideas. You create opportunities for them to share their ideas as well as their interactions with other peers. You give them a choice. You allow them to decide how they want to share their learning in ways that they feel most comfortable. So it could be uh, some students are unsure of what they might look like on a video. You might give them the option of being able to do the same task as a written, uh, written piece and send it across to you or vice versa. Uh, some of them might feel that they can draw something and send it across to you. Give them those options. The last of this is student visibility. How are you sharing their work? They're giving them that sense of achievement or recognition for a task that's been done well. You could send in reports to parents. You could create uh, small showcase portfolios for your students, which are sent across to everybody in the school, or perhaps just to the rest of their grades. So sharing their work with other classmates or other peers is also a sense, brings in a sense of, um, uh, of their work being shared and gives them a strong sense of ownership as well. So that's the context for today's discussion. We are going to be going into each of these different points, including student agency, checking for engagement, as well as um, putting out norms and expectations for our students. And all of our presenters today have something very exciting to share with all of you on each of these fronts. So I'm going to now ask uh, our first speaker uh, to come on board and start sharing uh, her presentation and her views with you. So I'd like to call upon Payal. Payal, over to you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Payal Datta Gupta, and I'm an IBDP biology educator and instruction leader with the Heritage Experiential Learning School. That is in Gurugram. Um, so I would like to start my presentation with this quote uh, by educator John Spencer. He is a college professor at the moment, and uh, he has authored books around student-centered uh, learning. It goes to say, one of the most common questions people asked me was, how do I convert my face-to-face -face course into an online course? The truth is, you cannot convert it. Learning isn't like a file that converts between a doc and a PDF and a Google Doc. We can't simply substitute new tools and do the same exact activity, which essentially means that the shift to a virtual or online learning program means that we need to engage in revised lesson planning with a focus on asynchronous and synchronous tests. I would like to talk about the three core guiding principles, which is relationship, relevance, and rigor, that fall, forms the basis of our learning and planning process at Heritage. Today, I've based my presentation on three key guiding questions, which is, how to manage the classroom by setting norms and expectations with students, how to promote student agency to build engagement, and how to check for understanding to sustain engagement. So the first part is about how to set norms and expectations with students. I'll talk a little bit how, about how uh, our school has taken the initiative and how I continue doing that during the lessons. So we have done a series of initiatives of sharing and making videos, as well as WhatsApp tiles and uh, website links, wherein we talk about the ways in which they can find and prepare for a virtual learning program. You can see up on the screen, there is a schedule, there is talking about setting up a daily learning routine. Um, we've also uh, emphasized on the study skills, like uh, brain learns better when, they, when you write it down. So the emphasis is given on having notebooks ready during a lesson. Uh, it also talks about the way that they need to set up their workstations, uh, that they need to cut off ambient noise to be able to focus and that they should not be engaged in multiple windows while the lesson is going on. Another important part of setting expectations is also about the learning management system that we use in our school. So any kind of communication with the students is through the learning management system. And uh, the students have been told to follow all instructions from the facilitators through the learning management system. The next piece is how to promote student agency during the lessons. So I'll share a bit about how I have gone about uh, doing it. So the two main questions that comes to mind is what is the learning objective for the lesson and what are the skills that need to be developed? So if we are thinking of developing skills like thinking skills, wherein the focus is on critical analysis and applying knowledge and synthesizing information and generalizations, then there are a multitude of tools which can be used. 
and I have also used these tools in the classrooms. Like there could be video lessons, there are video lessons in tethered lessons, there could be use of simulations, there could be use of virtual labs, as well as animated tutorials. All of these can be used through either a synchronous or an asynchronous task along with a set of questionnaire or guiding questions to help direct the thinking process among students. The next part about it is uh, how do we develop thinking as well as uh, work on communication skills. So if the focus is on developing uh, reading skills and writing skills, which uh, what are the ways in which that can be done? So what I've done in my class is uh, first, about, first is about engaging with the text. So if you want to engage with the text, um, it can be done with the help of a metacognitive marker where the students are uh, annotating the text. We could also use simple close reading activities and strategies and uh, the Jamboard or a Padlet or any of these tools can be used to help students to do this individual task. They can also be used as you can see when we were doing the learning objective of how auxin influences cell growth rate by changing the pattern of gene expression, the task was first about engaging with the text and then also putting their uh, writing skills and their thinking process in the form of a flowchart where I've used the Jamboard as a tool for that. This also helps to bring in collaboration later because all the students can engage on the Jamboard and they can ask questions to see clarifications. Now the next part is uh, if the learning target is something like outline the design of experiments to test the hypothesis about factors affecting germination. So if it is about building on a hypothesis, what kind of tools do we bring in? And the skill here that we need to build on is collaboration skill because the focus is about brainstorming together and coming up with ways in which they can build on the knowledge by understanding from each other. So if you can see the glimpses of examples which are on the screen, I have used the MindMaster, which is an excellent tool for building concept maps. So the uh, topic of discussion was around factors affecting germination. So after they engaged in this activity, the question, guiding question given on the concept map was, how do they think uh, they will avoid possible causes of clock failure? So they have brainstormed and the students can um, in real time work on this collaborative platform and build the concept further. Uh, the next task is about when you're deliberating on a particular design of an experiment involving seed germination. So what could be the considerations that you have to keep in mind while designing experiment? I've used a Mentimeter as a tool here, wherein the students can think about the possible considerations that they have to keep in mind. And this also helps everybody to collaboratively build on the concept here. The last part is how to check for understanding. So while designing a virtual lesson, it's important to understand that the brain can only retain, um, for, retain uh, or build on a concept for a maximum of 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and every lesson has to have a pause and checking for understanding. So the way I've gone about it, uh, let's say we are working on a database question. So the engagement on a database question requires a collaborative tool. So I've put it on Padlet and sometimes on Jamboard as well for that. And the task here is to work on collaborative skills, which is um, to help bring about communication where they understand the text and they are able to write or even, uh, even share their quotes, even share their answers on a collaborative platform. Uh, first, they share the observations of what they see in the data and then they engage in answering the questions. This piece here, it's about, uh, again, a communication skills like listening and writing, which is being addressed, where the students are sharing reflection post watching a video. And on this part, uh, this is an example of using a Google form or a Google quiz, particularly to do MCQs or even short response questions to look for understanding. Now, uh, once this is done, it's very fairly easy to go to the responses and look and, and check it as a diagnostic tool and also focus on the misconceptions that have arise during the particular lesson. So this is a very great, a good tool for checking for understanding. So after that, I would want to uh, leave everybody with this thought. This is a quote by AJ Giuliani, who is one of the educators I follow, and he has made a lot of initiative about virtual learning. It says that there are no magic bullets. There is a process and structure and it takes time. So uh, it is a continuous journey of learning and we learn from the feedback which our students give us. And uh, it helps if we are able to take the feedback and improvise on the lessons. So I hope 
um, whatever uh, it's a continuous learning and, uh, and I'm uh, wishing everybody all the best to take initiatives about this particular thing. The last bit, my key learning from the process is when physical distancing is deemed necessary, social and emotional connectedness is even more critical. So uh, at times, it's not only about syllabi, it's also about taking the pause and connecting with students and getting to know them and understand what is the, what is the social and emotional stress they are going through. And that really helps to keep the connection going. It, like I said, it is uh, in one of our core guiding principles, which is relationship. With that, I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, please do follow the work that we are doing around virtual learning program on our Facebook, Insta, Twitter, and LinkedIn handles. And you can contact me if you want to ask any questions on the email ID which is mentioned here. And, and uh, thank you, Pallavi, and thank you, Fiki, for giving me this opportunity. Over to you, Pallavi. Thank you so much for that very, very engaging uh, presentation, Payal. It was very interesting to see all the amazing things that you've been doing with your students. I love the note that you've left this on, which is about building relationships and that it's so crucial at this hour to be able to do that. Thank you so much for that, Payal. Um, and without um, wasting any time, I'd like to move on very quickly to our next speaker, uh, Barbara Bildry. Uh, Barbara, over to you to talk about what you're doing with your students in your school. Thank you very much, Pallavi. All right, so I'm Barbara Bilgrey, and I'm the MYP CAS and Service Action Coordinator at Al Rayyan International School in Accra, Ghana. I also teach the IB DP Environmental Systems and Societies course. ARIS is an independent international school, and we have just over 200 students in our secondary section. Class sizes are seldom more than 20 students, but frequently are smaller. In fact, the um, year 12 ESS class that I teach right now only has three students in it. Project and problem-based learning are my typical strategy for promoting learning in my classes. I've been able to apply this to the transition to online learning. Some of the lessons I will share with you were run in the physical classroom, but are easily adaptable to be run online. These guiding questions are going to address the three webinar themes of classroom management, student agency, and student engagement. Now, at my school, we use Google Classroom and Manage Back as our learning management systems, and we use these to communicate with our students. Um, homeroom is held before classes start each day, and what I do is share the daily timetable that my students will be um, attending, so my students know which classes they have to be prepared for and what times they need to be accessing Google Classroom to see the ta asynchronous and synchronous tasks. Also, on our homeroom um, Google Classroom streams, as well as our regular course streams, school virtual learning norms are posted. And these were developed with intention to help students master this process of virtual and remote learning. Now, in terms of my personal courses, at the beginning of each week, I post a weekly agenda with meeting days and times and asynchronous and synchronous activities. Then the night before a lesson, I post the daily agenda that includes the zoom to the link for the synchronous portion of the lesson. This is an activity I run based on a real life scenario here in Ghana. The landfill was built to last 20 years, but it exceeded its capacity in just seven years. So in this activity, I am Chief Barb of Greentown in the greater Accra area, and the students are the town council members. They work in specialist teams to research waste management techniques. Student teams present the pros and cons of their waste management strategy, and the town council comes together to debate the best integrated waste management strategy upon economic, social, and political factors. This is another activity I do in relationship to virtual labs. My students are required to learn how to apply the Lincoln Index to estimate population size. This online simulation allows them to vary the number of tagged fish so they can compare estimated to actual population size using a percent error. Students then evaluate the model's usefulness and present through infographics or online posters. 
This particular activity comes from Explore Learning Gizmos. I love the free resources on HHMI BioInteractive. Another lab that we do for our um, section on origins of biodiversity uses actual secondary data from Peter and Rosemary Grant's study on finch populations in the Galapagos. Students make a hypothesis, select appropriate data to address their hypothesis, and then use statistics to test the validity. I have a guided inquiry and a separate open inquiry to offer as differentiated options for my students. Now, I was a marine biologist conducting research on wild populations of dolphins and manatees in Belize before I ever became an educator. And I use that experience with my students. On my unit on marine protected areas and coastal zone issues, I have my friend and colleague virtually meet with my students to share recent research on coral reefs and mangroves, and then share the implications for economy and ecology in Belize. So students are exposed to a real world example by an expert. Also, each year, my students participate in an international youth collaboration through the Center for Global Education and Taking It Global. They have collaborated with students from over 30 schools in as many countries through Zoom and Google Apps to provide student voice and perspectives on issues of climate change and energy security. Some students meet at the end of the collaboration to produce a white paper, which synthesizes all the perspectives from all the youth in all the countries, and this paper is published and widely released. In non-pandemic years, the students will also get to attend activities at the UN COP conference on climate change. I also like to have face-to-face -face sessions with my students, which allow me to connect directly with them and develop relationships with them. One of the things that I do is I will sometimes do warm-up activities unrelated to academics. I share cooking how-to videos that I do myself. I run exercise activities with them, physical exercise activities, uh, or we do positivity exercises where the students complement each other. I also use this time to determine how the students are doing and what issues they are having with course tasks. I will meet with students individually to provide extra help or to provide feedback on their individual investigations. At my school also, other teachers and our support staff from the personalized learning department use Zoom breakout rooms to meet with students that need more, stu um, sorry, that need more support such as our SEN students or students who are having problems with internet connectivity at home and have fallen behind because of that. And finally, I wanted to talk about tools that we use as evidence of learning. We use Google Classroom to receive submission of student work, either through Google Apps or other means. And then we use Google Forms, CK12, and Education Perfect to perform online formative tasks. These particular platforms provide us analytics on the progress of the students, whether they're active and engaged, and how well they're doing at performing particular tasks. And using this feedback, teachers can then modify learning strategies online. I want to thank you for this opportunity. And if you would like more information, you can contact me at the displayed email address or find me on Twitter. You can also learn more about the amazing virtual learning strategies at Al Rayyan International School uh, by following them on their social media handles. I wanna thank Pallavi for the opportunity to do this and a shout out to Lenny Dutton who connected us together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Barbara. It was really amazing to see how you've actually brought so much of the real world into your classroom. It's absolutely fantastic to see also how your own experiences as a biologist have come to inform so much of what you're doing in your classrooms and how engaged your students are. Um, I love the fact that you were able to also draw in on some external resource persons and that's I'm sure something that has easily been made um, more viable now that everybody is online. So teacher, that's a good cue for all of you to start perhaps exploring some of those avenues as well. All right, let's stop a little bit to take a couple of questions that have come in. And uh, th these questions are all open to all of the panelists. So please feel free to, 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 uh, to, to, to let me know whichever ones you'd like to take on. 
Um, the first of these is that um, uh, teachers, some teachers are struggling with getting their children to come on camera. And they're wondering if this is something that should really be made mandatory. So what do you all think about that? Some children are shy and are hesitant to come on cameras. What are some solutions that you've been able to come up with for that? Any of the panelists would like to take that? Okay. Well, I, I personally don't think that we should force students to be on camera. And in my particular classes, I don't. In homeroom in the morning, I do make them come on camera for a few moments so I can check that they're dressed and ready for class. But I also respect that they are sh camera shy and don't wanna do that. But I have ways that we need to make sure that the students don't turn off their camera and step away from the devices and are still online. So we use resources like Pear Deck to ask questions and can see that the students are still responding or I might call on them to answer a discussion question or to contribute a thought just to make sure that they are still active and participating in the lesson. That's fantastic. Thank you for that, uh, Barbara. Payal, there's a special question that's coming for you, um, especially connected with the group work that you were uh, talking about. Uh, some, uh, uh, Samit Ghosh is asking that um, uh, in, in situations of group work, not all students always contribute equally. What have you been able to do to be able to address that? Uh, so group work, yes, there are challenges, of course, but uh, when you use random team gen uh, name generators or you kind of give everybody call out names individually and give opportunities for all of them to talk, some are also shy to come on camera and say it out loud, but they are very good when it is, has to be shared on a Padlet and they have to write it down. So it's about student choice and voice, like we said, and I'm okay as long as they are participating in any which form to share what their responses are. So I give them that choice and I have seen a higher uh, involvement and engagement during virtual lessons from all my students. So when the choice is there, I see a higher participation. Yeah. Can I so add something I, uh, to that? Is, sorry, Barbara, please go on. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I know that sometimes there's the issue of some students have carry more weight on group project than others. And I always provide a peer evaluation form and the kids always know that their peers are evaluating them and they are evaluating themselves. And then there are always follow up questions where summative grades are issued based upon an individual student's ability to answer questions on all aspects of a project. Doesn't always work, but it does reduce some of that push of some students pushing all the work on another student. That is, okay, you okay. Thank you for that, I'll just on. Sorry, Arjuna, can I just, I'll just, uh, we'll come back to some more of these questions in just a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll now request uh, our next speaker, which actually is Arjuna as well. So Arjuna, if you could, um, if you could take us through uh, some of the amazing work that you've been doing over at your school in Lucknow. And uh, I, on special request, I will be sharing Arjuna's presentation with all of you. So Arjuna, whenever you're ready, let me know. I'm ready. I'm ready. Over to you. Thank you, Pallavi. Thank you, Pallavi. So I am Archana Mishra from Sait Mr. Jaipuria School. Pallavi, I am on. Please, you can begin. Yep, absolutely. I'll start sharing my screen. So I am Archana Mishra from Sait Mr. Jaipuria School, Lucknow, the school for raising consciousness. And the whole world might be under lockdown, but learning is not. When others are taking care of the present, we teachers are taking care of the future. So today we'll talk about managing student engagement online. And this we have divided under three parts, which you will be seeing. Norms and expectations for online classes, protocol for class discussions, and rules for homework and assessments. So I'll take them one by one. Norms and expectations for online classes. In this, we sent out a whole detailed instruction letter to the parent that how we are going to manage all this. And a clearing expectation becomes very important because until and unless we clear our expectations, it becomes very difficult for the parents to understand what do we want. I'll not repeat because my previous speakers have already said what do we expect from children when we are talking about online classes. But side by side, we involve parents also that they should oversee what children are doing. 
Besides this, timetable, comprehensive timetables was made with activities uh, included. Activity periods excite them. We begin our day with the with yoga activity. Videos were sent to them, and uh, it became our uh, one of the USP. I would uh, call this thing. Then one very important thing which I would like to share with you, which we did, uh, was creating a special group for essential service parents. All those people who are busy uh, taking care of us, uh, we took care of them. And uh, messages were sent for them, and class teachers pitched in. And these special service, uh, essential service parents, a separate group was made. If if they have missed out anything in the daytime, like even the test, if they have missed out, that was uh, again uh, taken in the evening. So uh, for their support, we did it uh, side by side uh, for. The protocols and norms, we must say that uh, we are taking classes on Google Classroom, but how will they send homework? How will they be uh, getting back to us? This, this whole thing was cleared. We are taking homework on Google, Google Classroom and through mail. Deadlines were set because if we don't set deadlines, then children don't respond. And homework was expect, accepted on WhatsApp uh, also because some of our children, uh, they do not have access to Wi-Fi or broadband. So net connectivity, connectivity was the issue. So the idea was no child should be left behind. For class discussions, uh, collaborators are must. Class discussion should go on in a certain directions. Wherever uh, there was a thing which needed more clarity, parking lots were created. By parking lot, uh, we we must understand parking lot means that we put something to be discussed later on and this uh, thing helps us a lot then after this parking lot thing we uh, come to check about how to create interest and uh, i must tell you our teachers communicate at jaipuria in multiple format video of their own teachers are working very well mcq quizzes on google form audio file accompanied by a small task students send messages on class and google classroom in fact private messages they come in plenty and teachers effective feedback always works focus on teachers communication is very important teachers body language we take sanskrit class on whatsapp and here we see it every day that how children are connected to the teacher at this particular time when they are you know at home and when when they are not in their cushion area where they, they used to be in school teachers voice makes a lot of difference motivation and personal touch in fact is a deciding factor google meet plus classroom is a great hit we discuss things in google classroom and then take children to google meet for face to face problem solving for 15 20 minutes but problems have to be posted beforehand 100% engagement we have seen in this we run hindi classes on uh, google classroom and they are a great hit in fact uh, we we would like to inform everyone that all those who think hindi classes cannot be conducted on google classroom then we are doing it feedback is very important but quick and relevant feedback when teachers give to students they they perform this is the factor which motivates them. Constant checks for understanding we do. We, we divide our content in smaller portions. And then for understanding, some uh, small Google Forms tests are taken or some writing activity. With these, we come to know that all st uh, students are paying attention. We focus on peer and self-feedback also. Not all tests are supposed to be marked. And plugging in the problem if it is there. If any, I would request if any indisciplinary issues are there, they should be nipped in the bud. Thankfully, in our case, this did, didn't happen, but should, this should be there in the norms and instructions that we have to do that. And if we take care of that, there's no point why children will not do well. Online or offline, children are children and they like to study. They like to be with their teachers. And uh, learning is not bound uh, at any particular time. So uh, communication in multiple formats really helped. Then if we talk about homework, then homework feedback is also very important. And uh, homework feedback, after uh, taking care, uh, uh, making sure the children have submitted their homework, our teachers post solutions. And through these solutions, children can assess themselves where they are. And if there are certain problems, they can be understood later on. For student agency, when we talk about involving the student, 
and then, then we see, uh, I, I would like to again go back to our Hindi classrooms where uh, you can see on the Padlet I have uh, put everything here also you can see Muhabre, this particular uh, people say like teaching a language class is difficult on Google Classroom but cent percent result, our children type uh, in Hindi uh, in Google form test in Google Classroom and the only thing they have to do is put on Google input and this is done. Then when we talk about sharing their work, collaborative tasks, then it is the order of the day in Jaipuriya school, I believe. With everything, project work is involved. I would like to give you an example of decline of Indus Valley civilization. We did this chapter last week only. When it came to decline of Indus Valley civilization, we gave it to them. What is your take on, on it? What do you think about it? Why do you think this happened? Connect it with today. We are not teaching them for, you know, today. We are make, teaching them for, for their life. So all the life skills, you know, collaborative, critical thinking skills, or if we talk about problem solving skills, all should be here, they should put to use. Then they will make a difference in the world tomorrow. They, uh, in Jaipuriya, they make personal and social transformation projects also. And if you want more about this, please click on our website and you will see the videos of these projects over there. Children uh, do everything on their own. So I would say that uh, they were already doing it online. So involving them in the, in the task or uh, sharing their task was never a problem for us. And uh, yes, these transformation projects are not limited with personal only. They go to society. And yes, it is written in front of you, those who teach must never cease to learn. So we are also learning on daily basis. Daily our team sit back and revisits whatever happened during the day. And I must tell you over here that each and every lesson children learn is seen beforehand. Then only this happens. So we teachers are also learning during the lockdown. Thank you so much, Pallavi. Thank you so much for that very, very interesting uh, presentation. It was very, very interesting to see how your uh, teachers are looking at teaching Hindi and delivering that uh, Google Classroom for a lot of us uh, is a great boon because it's a multilingual medium and is also available to be used in various other regional languages as well. Um, so it's great to be able to see that, uh, you know, Hindi is being taught using Google Classroom. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm now going to give you uh, some inputs from a math classroom. Uh, so over to uh, Sangeeta ma'am for her presentation. Yes, Pallavi. So thank you so much, Pallavi, for uh, giving us the opportunity to share our experiences and learnings uh, in, at this, in this platform. And I'm here to share my experiences as a maths teacher. So I've been a maths teacher for 30 years and for last 20 years I've been teaching at Sanskriti school where I had the maths department. And Sanskriti school adopted Google Suite for Education five years back. So when we started looking at starting the new session remotely, uh, the most obvious thing was to jump onto the Google Classroom which was familiar to the teachers as well as the students. So Google Classroom, as you have heard from many other panelists, is a platform which we are using extensively for uh, not only posting of assignments, but also a 24 by 7 virtual classroom where students and uh, teachers are interacting. It is a place where announcements for the meet sessions goes up and also the recording of the meet sessions is posted just in case there are children who cannot attend any live session. Google Classroom has become a place to check the pulse of the class. So this is where just a small feature like a question in the Google Classroom is asked to understand how they are doing. How have they learned the lesson? Are they comfortable? Do they have any doubts? So again, giving them a chance to uh, reach out and for us to know how we are uh, progressing. Self-assessment quiz in maths is playing a huge role every day, every class ends with assigning of three to four questions in the form of quiz with a Google form. And the idea here is that children should sit down for 10 minutes and just answer these questions based on the content that they had learned on that particular day. Uh, the Google forms also release instant scores and also give students feedback in terms of maybe another resource which they can use to learn and uh, improve on their learning. This is definitely our uh, backbone of how we plan our next day lesson. So if there's a question which is not 
answered by most of them, then we do start our lesson with that particular question. Yes, Google Meet has been a boon because that has opened up the way for the live classes. So the live sessions are uh, done through the Google Meet. And yes, we do expect them to have the mic off and camera off as well. Senior students are definitely not open to opening the cameras, but we advise them to switch them off so that it doesn't cause any disturbance. But the younger ones are free to keep their cameras on if they wish to. But still the question always arises: that does it mean that they are there or not? So the query that came up earlier is always around even in our mind. So how do we manage our live session? The teacher goes in a usual way, the way maths is taught. You explain the concept, you demonstrate a solution of a question, and then the students learn to do the same and practice the same. So the method is explained, teachers take a pause and the students take a chance to work them out in their notebook. And then it is discussed and a follow up done. It helps to have multiple teachers in the call so that they can manage the chat. They can answer the queries coming in, alert the presenter and also uh, keep the very enthusiastic ones at bay because they would disclose the answer before the rest of them have caught on to this. So we teachers look forward to getting those dance in the chat for us to move on. Yes, maths is all about solving problems. And therefore we do depend on Google Slides where our answers are coming in transitions. It is not all the content coming in one go. So how do we know that they are engaged? We are bringing in certain interactive activities in between to make sure that the children are there to follow us. And for that, of course, Peer Deck is one of the best apps that you can use along with the Google Slides. So the add-on peer decks is allowing us to create these interactive moments where the children feel free to answer the questions, to react and respond, to perhaps just draw. And that is very, very valuable at this time. Another tool that is a very strong maths tool is Desmos. Desmos is an online graphing calculator, but it also has a component of classroom activities. And these classroom activities are there on their website, teacher.desmo.com, but also these activities, some of them you can customize. And as a teacher, you can even create your own activities. These activities are generally nothing but prompts, prompts for students to explore the mathematical concept and then to reflect on what they have observed, make a conjecture perhaps, and for the teacher to follow them in the live mode. So this can be used again as a synchronous which is a teacher-based activity, asynchronous where the students follow their own pace. And any time I open a particular card, I would be able to see the work coming in and the discussion can be done if I put the class on pause. So this gives us a dashboard, which gives a summary of how the class is going. Let's us create those challenging movements by card sort, where if I see a card sort, which is incorrectly placed, it gives teachers an opportunity to teach. So we put the class on hold, there is a pause button there, and everybody focuses on one deck, and then we figure out what's wrong with those answers. So that definitely helps us. Desmos also has a lot of these activities for the exit tickets. So you can have just a confidence check done or a general check-in in terms of how the students are feeling in terms of their energy level, perhaps. So Desmos is our go-to tool for many our times. Our younger ones are always very keen to learn from videos, but just sending out a video is not enough. So we use the egg puzzle, which is helping us to track the use of these videos. We can insert questions and we can also follow the progress of the students as they watch or if they do not watch that video. So that helps us to make the lesson complete in terms of using a media which otherwise is making a big difference. The middle school students are the most enthusiastic one. Everybody wants to unmute and ask. So that is where teachers are using flippity.net to just generate random names. And then the class is uh, alert. They know that if their name comes up, they might have to pitch in, they might have to answer, they might have to summarize the lesson. And so this random name picker is being used to keep the children on toes and not drift away from the calls. 
So what I started with as a certain disadvantage that we do not have blackboards in our classroom has this challenge has now turned into an opportunity where I'm using a small app, online app like whiteboard.fi to send out whiteboards to each and every student in the call, letting them explore the mathematical concept, visualize them and turn this challenge into opportunity. I hope some of these ideas would work for you and you will also make your lessons more engaging for your children. Thank you, everyone. Thank you ever so much for that very, very interesting presentation, uh, Sankita. It was amazing to see the kind of work that you're doing with math. For a lot of math teachers, teaching math online is a very, very tedious process. And I think you've significantly simplified that for them today. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions. And uh, with these questions, we'll also... Um, uh, address uh, some of the, the stuff that's come specifically for the panelists. Uh, so Payal, there was a special question again for you. Payal, you're very popular with our participants. Uh, they were asking, how is it that you're able to collect samples? I think this is something to do specifically with uh, bio. So maybe both you or Barbara uh, could perhaps uh, take that question on. Okay, so this was regarding uh, the IAs and the sample connection. So we are still uh, working on our pre-draft. Uh, and the focus is, of course, it's a challenge because we don't know when we are going back to school um, and what would be the process of taking um, data. So at the moment, we are working on the research question and trying to deliberate on ways in which these trials can be done at home. That's the first step. And hoping that when the school reopens, we'll be able to run the trials then. So that's what we are doing right now. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, there was also a couple of questions about uh, differentiation when we're trying to scaffold the work for uh, higher order and lower order learners. So how are we going to do that when we're teaching online and how do we make sure that our lower order learners don't actually get left behind? Yeah, so if I may just uh, add on to that again, yes, there are uh, ways of doing that through various tools. So Google Classroom is a great tool for differentiation. So when you send out an assignment, then it need not send out to all the class students in the class. You can select certain specific students who may need that uh, special help. Also, their sessions can are being held uh, for maths. The parallel maths is being held specially for those children separately and not in the common group. So that definitely, because when you have tool, you can do things individually and differentiation in fact becomes easier uh, because they, are, they don't necessarily have to be in the same pool. Okay. Like Valavi, we also use the uh, LMS and we can create smaller groups and the groups, the teacher has the flexibility of assigning differentiated tasks. Um, so for somebody who would take a little more time, the guiding questions are further tunneled so that it leads towards that thinking process. And that can be differentiated and shared with different groups accordingly. Also, some of the self-paced video lessons can also be shared, which they can take at their own time asynchronously. Right. And I think Payal's response also covers some of the, the, the questions that have come up with regards to device-related challenges and challenges of having uh, data, ac uh, data accessibility. I think if we are to send students work asynchronously and ask them to complete it at their own time, that does help us to address the challenge of there being only one device or two devices per household, where children can then take, the, take their own time for a couple of days and try and um, solve that assignment and send it across back to their teachers. Um, it's also one thing that's coming up very, very repeatedly, and I thought perhaps some of you might have experienced this as well, um, parents popping into sessions. And how is it that your school has addressed that uh, we all know that parents come from a place of love and concern. So how do you teachers deal with that? Archana, please go ahead. She's on mute. I think your mic is on mute. Uh, in senior section, this didn't happen, uh, Pallavi. Yeah. But in junior section, it happens. But uh, it's out of love only. And they don't disturb in our case. So it's okay. The more, the merrier. They are there. And in fact, sometimes class is so interesting that they are, they are pulled into it, you know. So that is, again, uh, a plus point for us. That they say that uh, video was playing or such nice activity was happening that we couldn't, you know, stop ourselves. So it's okay. 
we need to be open about these things if they are not disturbing it's okay they are our they are our extension kind of All so right. with us there is no such problem they are welcome okay thank you but i know that some schools like to set some protocols around parents not being around for calls so of course this is something that teachers can uh, take their own uh, take on their own discretions okay so with that we'd like to call it a day and we'd like to wrap up our session thank you so much teachers for all the amazing insights that you all offered uh, i'd like to invite uh, anirudh back to uh, close the session for today thank you pallavi thank you everyone um... that was extremely exciting uh, you know to see how teaching has really evolved in the current times and congratulations to all educators out there i'm quite sure this is the new normal and will also remain post covid when schools open physically schools of the future we always talk about that are actually dependent on how today's educators are going to take their learnings into their regular classroom practice so today is the future that's what i'm trying to say we talk about future but today is the future some things i got out of the entire presentation set clear norms beforehand uh, clear expectations respect children's privacy i think that is very important uh, do activities with children beforehand it keeps them activated send reminders uh, provide quick feedback uh make room for collaborative learning i really like that one through various breakout sessions finally i think the the cherry on the cake for me is that amongst all this take care of the social emotional well being which is of prime importance for our little ones uh whether they are 9 to 12 6 to 9 they'll all be little ones for us um i would like to conclude by thanking uh, pallavi devedi from higher thank you for moderating the session very very valuable insights you gave all our panelists uh, ms barbara bilgre archana mishra sangeeta gulati payal datta gupta thank you so much for all your insights all the viewers um, who have taken time out and seen the webinar today in fact i was wrong we have cumulatively done 45000 views not 25000 so uh, that's that's a little mistake i made i'm sure you have i i hope all of you have gone with something valuable uh finally a big thank you to fikki and fikki arise to host this webinar series uh the current team of fikki you know we we cannot do without them which is malika marwa and simreen gauri they're on the call they're always at the background you will never see their faces but they are the ones driving the show thank you everyone for all your time and effort and see you next series thank you thank you so much thank you so much thank you much everybody bye